Good morning. Welcome to New Era Reformed Church. We're glad that you're here on this holiday weekend, uh, the 4th of July. And we just, uh, yeah, just a great chance uh, today through the weekend. I hope you have a chance to celebrate, um, to remember uh, the sacrifices that have been made, uh, to be thankful for this country that we have and the freedoms that we have, um, and really to pray for God's blessings in the future as we continue on. Um, we are have a few different things today. I'm glad Pastor Jean Lemihu is here with us this morning. Pastor Rick and family um, are enjoying a much anticipated uh, family vacation with everybody all together out east. Um, so we're hoping they're having a great time enjoying their new grandson, new nephew, and uh, just some good family time for them. So we're hoping for good things for them. Um, before we get started, I just wanted to share a um, story. Pastor Jean is going to be talking about um, God's unexpected ways. Um, as I thought about that this week, um, I was reminded of this uh, story. When I graduated from college. There was a group of five of us um, good friends, um, one of them named Tasha. And this past December, she contracted COVID. And because of some underlying conditions, um, within a few weeks, she found herself in the hospital, as I'm sure many of you have stories of the same. Um, as the group texts went around, you know, some small victories, some setbacks, um, we were just praying that she would stay off, not have to go on a ventilator, that her lungs would start working as they needed to, and all those things. Um, about middle of January, we got a group text saying um, that she had been put on a ventilator. And we were all a little disheartened, discouraged, uh, dismayed about that. Until we got a text from her son, Justin, who sent around the fact that this ventilator for Tasha um, was an answer to prayer. Uh, you see, Tasha had been very anxious and had a lot of anxiety about the ventilator. Um, and she had been refusing it. And the nurses and the doctors finally convinced her to allow herself to be sedated and to be put on the ventilator. And those two things um, were what allowed her body to rest and to be able to heal. Um, and I think it was about in April or May, um, she was able to go home. Um, it was a long battle. But it just was interesting to me as I thought about her going on a ventilator and how that was bad news for me at first. In hindsight, and when you find the details, you realize how God needed her to, he wanted her to, needed to be on that ventilator to bring healing to her. Um, and so God does work in unexpected ways sometimes. Um, his ways are different than ours. So Pastor Jean's going to share um, some more about that. Lots of stories in the Bible about God using unexpected ways to bring about his will. Um, one of which uh, we're going to start off with in our praise and worship time this morning. Um, and that is the way that God chose to save this world, right? All of the scholars and the best known teachers of the world did not expect Jesus, did not expect a baby, did not expect a death, did not expect a resurrection. Um, but it was what God had in store for us. Um, and we worship him today because of that. So I'm going to have you stand um, and we're going to worship um, our God of unexpected ways.
things that you've done for us. And even, Lord, even in those trials and in those times where we just don't know what to do, Lord, you still have a plan for us. You still know where we're going to go. And you are still a blessing. It's in your name that we pray. Amen. Shall we pray? Gracious Heavenly Father, as we come to you this day, we thank you for this week that we celebrate uh, the freedom of independence. We celebrate that uh, with all the freedoms you give us, for freedom to worship you, as we see. We also thank you for the freedom that we've gotten from you sending your son to save us. We thank you for all the freedoms that you've given us. We'd like to ask that you uh, be with the Roger and Kathy Fessenden family as they go through the um, um, death of Kathy's mother. We have to be at Margaret Amstetz as she um, is enduring uh, cancer treatments. We have to be with Rick and Mary Ann as they go through this time of discernment to find God's will in their life. Be also with this church as we go through a search for a new pastor to lead us and uh, give us the strength and the wisdom to find the right person that you have um, willed to be in our life here at New River Reformed Church. We ask all these things in thy name. Amen. Good morning. Good morning. It's good to be with you all here again. I think I was here, I can't remember if it was maybe August. Um, everybody was wearing masks, or most everybody, so it's just great to see your faces and your smiles again. That's awesome. I did get a little note from my daughter Jennifer. Jennifer and Joshua serve in Papua New Guinea, and so she wanted me to update you. Now, while we are enjoying a beautiful Michigan summer, they are still enjoying winter, and they've really struggled the last couple months with allergies, sinus problems, cold, sore throats, and fevers, and and they were exposed to COVID, so you know how that all goes. So anyway, this is our latest update. Thank you so much for praying for Josh and me. My sore throat is finally going away after almost two weeks of painful swallowing, and Josh's cough is mostly gone now too. It is just in time for me to begin our two-week discipleship course with Culture Meets Scripture. So she's just completed a week, and now we'll have another week this week. We have about 15 Papua New Guineans whom we hope to mentor in order to have them help us with future workshops as well as to strengthen their own understanding of God. We look forward to learning much together. Josh is still very busy at work with lots of maintenance decisions while they are short-staffed. Praise God, one of the licensed mechanics returned to P&G and should be out of quarantine this week. We are thankful for the opportunities to minister here in a variety of ways. Thank you again for being part of our team and blessings in Christ, Jenny and Josh. And she is actually receiving mail again. We sent her a mail for her birthday the end of February. She actually got it the end of June, so that's encouraging. <laughs> But for a long time, because of COVID, they were not getting mail or packages, but she's encouraging people to write again because it appears that mail is somehow or another getting through. This morning, God's word comes to us from 2 Kings chapter 5, and just a really quick, short background to 2 Kings, Israel where the 
the story takes place, it's the story of Naaman, but Israel is in spiritual and national decline. They've been split for a while into the northern kingdom, which worships in Samaria, the southern kingdom, which worships in Judah. Our story today takes place in the northern kingdom. The northern kingdom had about 20 kings during the time of first and second kings, and the kings were described as either faithful or unfaithful to God, and the northern kingdom had no kings that were faithful to God. They all did evil what was, that was inside of the Lord. So we can see why they are in decline at this time. So let's go to God in prayer, and then we'll dig into the passage. God, we thank you for your word today, and we thank you for your Holy Spirit. We pray that your Holy Spirit will work among us today as we look into your word, Lord, and that you will help us to see the things you want us to see and help us to apply them to our own lives here in the 21st century. I pray that you would come now and anoint me with your Holy Spirit for the preaching of your word. And Lord, we are just so grateful for all the word, all the ways that you bless us and encourage us as we meet together as the body of Christ. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. So the story of Naaman is probably familiar to a lot of you, and it's quite an involved story, and I'm only taking part of it because that's all I can deal with in one message today. So when I cut it off at verse 15, it's not the end of it. So you might want to go home and read the whole story and see what actually God does with the rest of that passage. So 2 Kings chapter 5, verses 1 through 15. Now Naaman was commander of the army of the king of Arum. He was a great man in the sight of his master and highly regarded because through him the Lord had given victory to Arum. He was a valiant soldier, but he had leprosy. Now bands from Arum had gone out and had taken captive a young girl from Israel, and she served Naaman's wife. She said to her mistress, if only my master would see the prophet who is in Samaria, he would cure him of his leprosy. Naaman went to his master and told him what the girl from Israel had said. By all means, go, the king of Aram replied. I will send a letter to the king of Israel. So Naaman left, taking with him 10 talents of silver, 6,000 shekels of gold, and 10 sets of clothing. The letter that he took to the king of Israel read, with this letter I am sending my servant Naaman to you so that you may cure him of his leprosy. As soon as the king of Israel read the letter, he tore his robes and said, Am I God? Can I kill and bring back to life? Why does this fellow send someone to me to be cured of his leprosy? See how he's trying to pick a quarrel with me. When Elisha, the man of God, heard that the king of Israel had torn his robes, he sent him this message. Why have you torn your robes? Have the man come to me, and he will know that there is a prophet in Israel. So Naaman went with his horses and chariots and stopped at the door of Elisha's house. Elisha sent a messenger to say to him, Go, wash yourself seven times in the Jordan, and your flesh will be restored, and you will be cleansed. But Naaman went away angry and said, I thought that he would surely come out to me and stand and call on the name of the Lord his God, wave his hand over the spot, and cure me of my leprosy. Are not Abana and Farpar, the rivers of Damascus, better than any of the waters of Israel? Couldn't I wash in them and be cleansed? So he turned and went off in a rage. Naaman's servants went to him and said, My father, if the prophet had told you to do some great thing, would you not have done it? How much more then when he tells you wash and be cleansed? So he went down and dipped himself in the Jordan seven times, as the man of God had told him. 
and his flesh was restored and became clean like that of a young boy. Then Naaman and all his attendants went back to the man of God. He stood before him and said, Now I know that there is no God in all the world except in Israel. Naaman's story, for me, is full of some surprises. Surprises that show us who God is and what his kingdom is like. It was kind of interesting, after I chose this passage and decided kind of what angle I wanted to take on it, the element of surprise, only a couple days later I got the letter from New Era Reformed that said Pastor Rick was leaving. I went, surprise? I was shocked. Maybe you were too. And I thought, well, this is the passage I was led to, but does it really have anything to say to them now? But I think that it does, and I think it has a lot to say to all of us. There are two things I want to center on when I talk about the surprises that I see in the passage. The first is, who was this Naaman who was healed? And secondly, how did his healing actually come about? We learn about Naaman right away in that verse, first verse. He's a commander of the army of the king of Arum. Now, Arum is also known as Syria and Mesopotamia, Mesopotamia. It's north of Israel along the Mediterranean Sea. And from the book of Genesis on, these two countries, Israel and Arum, or Syria, had been in conflict with each other. So we're talking about a man who's like second in command to the king of Arum, the commander of the army, but the army is in battle with Israel. We know that he's Naaman's great, he's highly favored by the king, he's highly regarded by his soldiers, he's valiant, but we also know he had a flaw. He had leprosy. Now the word for leprosy here can just mean a skin disease. So we don't know exactly what he had. But we know that in ancient Israel, skin diseases made people unclean. And they could not worship in the temple. I don't know if that was the same in a room or Syria at that time. But I'm guessing that there were some stigmas attached to it and that that leprosy, whatever it was, the skin disease, got in the way of his relationships. His wife, his family, his work as a commander in the army, his relationship with the king. And I don't know what he did in his own country to seek healing. They, after all, were worshipers of Baal, but probably had their own healers. But we know he's desperate for healing. But here's the first surprise for me in the story. We read that he had a lot of victories because the Lord had given him those victories. Is that a surprise to you? That God, who had a covenant with his people Israel, would give victory to the commander of the army of the enemy? We have a friend who's a missionary in a Muslim country. He's never disclosed his location to us. But this week he posted on Facebook that terrorists had cut the power lines in their city. And then just as authorities were going to tap into a second power line, they cut that one as well. And he said, I understand how David felt when he speaks in the Psalms about his enemies David had choice words to speak to God about his enemies. And I think our missionary friend had choice words that day and probably many days when he sees what the terrorists are doing to the country he's in. And yet, we know the Lord is behind the victories of Naaman. So that's the first unexpected surprise to me. The second, I think, is about how he is healed. And we learn very quickly in the passage that, he, that the healing is initiated by a little girl, a little girl who is taken captive, probably by 
Naaman himself when he went into Israel on one of his raids. So here's this little captive Israelite girl serving Naaman's wife. And she remembers where she came from. And she remembers the prophet Elisha in her home country and how he is doing miracles of healing there. So she tells Naaman's wife, if my master would just go to Samaria and see Elisha the prophet, he would be cured of his leprosy. And Naaman's wife tells Naaman, and Naaman tells the king, and the king says, yes, you need to go, and I'll write a letter so that we can have a little truce here between the two countries, and you can get healed. So that's part of the second surprise for me, that Naaman, who's desperate for healing and has probably sought healing from all the healers in his land, now his healing is going to happen because of this little unnamed girl. Interesting part of the story. So you know how it goes. Naaman goes to his master. He gets the letter. The king of Israel now, the king of Israel, who's supposed to be the person that represents God to his people and, you know, performs justice and makes sure the people are living according to God's commands, the king of Israel seems to have no either knowledge of Elisha and what he's doing or memory of him, and he's just upset by the letter. He makes all kinds of assumptions. And so he throws this little fit and says, am I God? Can I kill and bring back to life? Why is he sending his commander to me? He's just trying to pick a quarrel with me. But then Elisha hears about the king tearing his robes and sends him his message and says, why have you torn your robes? Send the man to me and he will know that there is a prophet in Israel. So there goes Naaman with his entourage, his servants, his chariots, his horses, his ample pounds of gold and silver and ten sets of clothing, and stops at the door of Elisha's house. And I thought, okay, going from the king's palace to Elisha's house has to be a little bit like staying at the Hilton and then having to move to Motel 6 right? I can't believe that Elisha really had a very fancy house, but that's where he goes. And then Elisha doesn't come out of his house to greet him, but he sends his servant. And the servant tells Nahum how he can be healed. Go wash yourself seven times in the Jordan. Your flesh will be restored and you will be cleansed. And now it's not the king of Israel throwing a fit, but it's Naaman, the commander of the army of Arum, throwing a fit. He is deeply offended. Elisha didn't even come out of his house to greet me. He sent his servant. I mean, I thought he would come and greet me and stand and call on the name of the Lord and wave his magic wand over my leprosy and I would be healed. And then he's complaining about having to go to the Jordan River, which was a muddy river. And he starts talking about the great rivers in his own country, in the capital of Damascus. Why couldn't I just be there if that's what I had to do? Why couldn't I do that in my own country in these wonderful, you know, probably had artesian well springs in them or something? I don't know. So he turns and goes off in a rage. Now, do you see the contrast here? The people throwing fits, the people getting all upset and offended and concerned have no knowledge of God. And yet it is the servants, the people without names, the little girl, the little captive girl, the servant of Elisha, who gives the instructions on how to be healed, and now Naaman's unnamed servants who convince him to actually do it. They said, look, if he had told you to do something really difficult, wouldn't you have done it to be healed? Now it's just a simple thing. Go dip in the Jordan seven times and you're going to be cleansed. Why not just do that? And Naaman listens to his servant and he goes down and dips himself in the Jordan seven times and his flesh was restored and he became clean like that 
of a little boy. It says he went down. He actually descended. He had to humble himself to do it. And we know what the results are. He's healed. He's completely healed. And then he and all his attendants go back to the man of God, Elisha, and he stands before him. His posture now is different. He's gotten off his high horse, and he stands humbly before Elisha with a heart full of gratitude. And he knows there is no God in all the world except in Israel. What a great story. And yet the contrast between the powerful and the powerless are just so great in this story. As I was thinking about it this week, I thought, this story could be in the Gospel of Luke, that gospel of great reversals. You know, the proud are humbled, and the, and the humble are lifted up and exalted. It sounds like Mary's song from the Magnificat. Remember Mary's song? And then... As I was studying, I found out, hey, this story is in the Gospel of Luke. And it's found in Luke 4, verse 27. Not really the story itself, but Jesus makes a reference to it. And it's very in the very beginning of his ministry. And he's gone to the synagogue, as was his practice in those days. He was teaching. And he goes to the synagogue in his hometown. And they hand him the scroll, as was their practice, and he turns to Isaiah 61. And he says, the spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prison prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to release the oppressed and to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And then he rolls up the scroll and sit down and the people are all whispering wow, this man, he speaks with such authority. They were so impressed, and they were praising him to one another. Could this really be Jesus, that little kid we saw running around in his dad's stonemason shop, used to play with our kids in the village? Could this really be him? And then Jesus gets up, because after they read, then they expound on the passage, and he says to them, today this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. Right there, he announces that he's the promised Messiah. Well, then he goes on, and things change very quickly. He says, now you're probably going to say to me, physician, heal yourself and do some great miracle in my hometown. But the truth is, a prophet is not accepted in his own hometown. And then he says this, I assure you, there were many widows in Israel in Elijah's time when the sky was shut for three and a half years and there was a severe famine throughout the land. Yet Elijah, the prophet before Elisha, was not sent to any of them, but to a widow in Zarephath in the region of Sidon, a foreign country. And here comes Naaman. And there were many in Israel with leprosy in the time of Elisha the prophet. Not one of them was cleansed, only Naaman the Syrian. And the people are deeply offended by his words. We read that they were furious. They got up, drove him out of town, and took him to the brow of the hill on which the town was built in order, him to, throw, in order to throw him down the cliff. And what they would do is they would throw a person over the cliff and then pick up stones and stone them to death. But Jesus, who said he would perform no miracles in his hometown, performed a miracle. He walked right through the crowd and went on his way. Why did the people in the synagogue in Nazareth turn on Jesus the way that they did? Deeply offended, no miracle to back up who he was, no sign, but even worse, his reference to God, the God of Israel, the covenant God who promised to bless them and make their nation great, and that they would be a blessing to all the nations. That his prophets weren't sent to the people in Israel, but they were sent outside to foreign countries to the Gentiles, 
that's what was deeply offensive to the Jews in the synagogue in Nazareth. The whole story, the reference in Luke 4, verse 27, points us to what God is like, what's on his heart, and what the kingdom of God is, is like. I mean, how many centuries before Jesus came was the story of Naaman? Seven centuries, eight centuries, perhaps? And Israel already is rebelling against God, guilty of immorality, idolatry, injustice. The kings are evil in the sight of the Lord. And now all these centuries later, what has happened? Has anything really changed in Israel? Are they ready for Jesus the Messiah? Now we have their party. They follow the party lines of the Pharisees or the Sadducees or the Essens or the Zealots. And they want Jesus to line up with their party. And they want him to be this great political figure who will overthrow their enemy, the Roman government, and place him on a throne. But Jesus will have none of that. And in Luke, this is the beginning of what Jesus' journey is going to be like in his life on earth. And we know the rest of the story. Finally, they nail him to a cross. And he dies to save them, yes, from their sins, to release them from their guilt and their shame. But he does more. He does it and is risen from the dead and establishes this kingdom of God which continues to this day and will continue forever and ever. And God doesn't change. And God is still doing unexpected and surprising things because the kingdom, my friends, is among us. Still there are healings. I was reminded this week when I... Um, recently went to a church down in Holton, and somebody says, can you come? We're praying for a man with cancer. I said, sure, I'll come. And there were a group of, this, of us there, and I was reminded we were praying in their prayer garden, and I, and I thought of this story, which fits so well with our story today of Naaman. But a friend of mine was praying for a man in that church who had a skin disease. He had psoriasis. And as they were praying in uh, this prayer garden at their church, the Lord came and totally cleared his arm and his skin was restored and it didn't come back. That's the God we save. We, we, that's the God we worship today. He is still doing miracles among us. Naaman's not only physically healed, he becomes a child of God. He is saved. I remember someone here uh, one time telling me that Salvation came to them after they were physically healed. They didn't know God, but God came to them and healed them, and then they became saved and a child of God. This is just the surprising way that God works. God loves his people, and it wasn't just the Jews. He loved the Gentiles, and he was showing his heart way back in the Naaman story and before that as well. All around the world today, people are coming to faith. And for me, it's so surprising that the places where Christianity is growing today are places like Iran. Exponi exponential growth of people coming, Muslims coming to Christ in the last 20 years. 25 years ago, none of us would have predicted that. A similar thing is happening in Afghanistan. Tim and I met uh, some Christians from the persecuted church of China a couple years ago. They were meeting in house churches. They were all young people, basically. I would, some of them were just married, some of them were single, and they talked about um, their stories, and they were new converts in Christ, and those, those house churches are just growing in places where the church is persecuted. God's kingdom comes, and God continues to do the unexpected and surprising things. Naaman, he didn't deserve to be saved. He wasn't even a part of God's chosen nation, not that they deserve to be saved either. None of us deserve salvation, and yet God, in his mercy and grace, grants it through his son, Jesus Christ. I was thinking about the kingdom of God and what it's like and what this story tells us about it. So 
here's some things that I wrote, and I have to read them because I just added them at the end of my study, and I, I, I didn't learn them, so here we go. It's a kingdom where the powerless are weak, and the weak are powerless. It's a kingdom where the way down is actually up. It's a kingdom where power, wealth, and privilege often do nothing, and the unnamed servants accomplish God's purposes. It's a kingdom where washing in a muddy river can make one whole. It's a kingdom where no one deserves God's grace, and the most li least likely to receive it gets it anyway. It's a kingdom where the one true God of Israel sends a baby into the world to a powerless teenage girl, and that baby is God. It's a kingdom where a cross leads to a resurrection, and a resurrection leads to an ascension. It's a kingdom where a crucified king comes to sit at the right hand of God in the heavenly realms and rules over every nation, every power, every dominion, and every authority in the earth. It's a kingdom whose very signs that it exists on earth are when the lame walk, the blind see, and the lepers are cleansed. It's a kingdom where political rulers do not have the power, but God's children are given Christ's power and authority to do the work of God on earth. Let that one sink in. It's a kingdom where God is bringing in people from every nation, tribe, and language. It's a kingdom where the only way to save your life is to lose it. It's a kingdom where wherever the church worships its Lord in spirit and truth and surrenders to him, unity and holiness return to it. Friends, the story of Naaman is a story of the kingdom of God. The story begins and ends with God. He's in every detail of the story in accomplishing what he came to do. And his name descended into the Jordan River and became whole and became like a little child. So we descend into the waters of baptism and become children of God. Thanks be to God. Let's pray. Lord, give us spiritual eyes this week to see your kingdom at work in our world and open our hearts to receive it with joy. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. This morning we are going to have communion, participate in that sacrament, and I'm wondering if there's anyone that did not get the little cup thing when they came in, because you will need it today. Anyone that still needs it? At the appropriate time, and we'll be doing this together, you'll just take off the top of it, and there's a little wafer, and we're going to eat that together, and then you turn it over, take off the top of it again, and we will drink from the cup together. I think it's easy for us to grasp that the Lord's Supper or Communion or Eucharist or whatever you are used to calling it is a sacrament where we remember the Lord's death until he comes again. A memorial service, if you would, to remember what Christ did on the cross. I think it's much more difficult for us to comprehend that Jesus tells us when we do this and obey this, this command of his with these simple elements, that Jesus is present with us. So with that in mind, I want to begin today with a prayer, so please bow your heads in prayer with me. Lord Jesus, we come eager to remember how you gave your life on the cross, that we might have life in you today, that we might have our sins forgiven once again because of your laying down your life for us. Thank you, Jesus, for making the ultimate sacrifice for us so we could be free to live our lives without the burden of guilt, without the weariness of trying to measure up or to be good enough. We receive your gift of grace with thankfulness and joy. We come to welcoming your presence at this, your table. 
We confess that we can hardly believe sometimes that you are really here with us when we drink of the cup and eat that bread. That you stand here ready to lift up our hearts, to renew our faith, to nourish us and strengthen us for the journey ahead. We give thanks that we can come today with empty hands and open hearts to receive a fresh infilling of your Holy Spirit. We are not our own, but bought with the price, the price of the shedding of your blood. Fill us today again with your love, your grace, and your peace. Fan into flames today the gifts of the Spirit that you have given us to bless those you put in our path, to lead your church, to serve your world. Where there is discouragement and doubt, Lord, give us spiritual wisdom and discernment to know your will for us and to guide and lead us in the way we are to go. Where there is physical limitation and illness, Lord, we ask for healing. Help our unbelief. We ask you to pour out your love into our hearts this morning that you may heal the division that keeps us from experiencing the fullness of fellowship in the body of Christ. Help us to experience again that blessed koinonia that you have promised your church. Lord, as we eat this bread and drink from this cup, cleanse us and make us new. We thank you for your faithful love and for your mercy that is new every morning. May your light and your love shine through us in new ways as we leave this place refreshed, renewed, replenished, and restored. Give us spiritual eyes to see and behold you in all your beauty and glory as we receive these simple gifts. We love you, Jesus. And let's join our hearts and our, our minds as we pray the Lord's Prayer together in unison. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner, after supper, Jesus took the cup and poured it out and said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. As often as you drink from this cup, remember me. And the Apostle Paul adds these words, for as often as we eat of the bread and drink of the cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he returns. I invite you now to take your cups and to remove the tab with the wafer underneath and look up here when you're all set with that. Friends, take, eat, and remember that Christ's body was given for the complete forgiveness of all our sins. And then just turn that cup over and once again take off the tab. and hold it up when you're ready. People of God, <clears throat> take, drink, and remember that Christ's blood was shed for the complete forgiveness of all our sins.
Beloved in the Lord, since the Lord has nourished our souls at his table, let's praise his holy name with thanksgiving. From Psalm 103, bless the Lord, O my soul, all my inmost being, praise his holy name. Praise the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. He forgives all my sins, and he heals all my diseases. He redeems my life from the pit and crowns me with love and compassion. And from Psalm 145, my mouth will speak in praise of the Lord. Let every creature praise his holy name forever and ever. Amen. We're going to do just that. We're going to praise. We're going to sing. Would you stand and join us? This next song just reminds us that we're not meant to just exist and kind of go through the motions, but in Christ, we're meant to thrive and to grow. Um, we're going to sing and we're going to praise.
from this place. May the love of God, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen.